This might be weird to hear for some, but I was never really a person who put a big stake in milestone years. When we reached 2010, nothing particularly felt different, and I imagine the same will be true for 2020. That said, I understand that there's something satisfying about cataloging and ranking things, and decades happen to be a good measure of time for culture to develop and mature. The 2010s were overall a great decade for games, though I feel they were a decade that had very high highs but incredibly low lows. If you are a Nintendo fan like I am, this decade was actually pretty terrible until the second half. Thankfully, other developers were able to pick up the slack while Nintendo floundered with the Wii U. Everyone else has been ranking their favorite games of the past 10 years, and I decided to throw my hat in the ring as well. Keep in mind I can only list games that I actually played on here, and my tastes skew more towards older games. That said, I definitely played my fair share of excellent titles from this past decade. They just not might have been the most high profile of releases. So without further ado, here are my 9 favorite games of the past decade. This game is likely on almost everyone's Game of the Decade list, which shouldn't be too surprising. I was actually pretty late to the party when it came to Dark Souls, but I did have a chance to be on the ground floor. My brother was into the series since he got Demon Souls around 2011 or so. I could have been right there with him, but I decided to pass on it since it seemed to be too hard. It wasn't until years later that I finally gave the series a shot after watching Matthew Matosis' Souls commentary videos. I feel kind of bad because I probably would have appreciated the games even more if I hadn't watched the videos, but on the other hand, I might not have even played them had I not given them a watch. Besides, I still love both games a ton. I personally like Demon Souls more, but since that came out in 2009, it barely misses the cut. So what is it that I like so much about Dark Souls? I won't go too deep into it because I'm sure people are sick of hearing the same shit about this game, but what drew me into Dark Souls was the way it doesn't treat you like an idiot. It feels like a lot of retro games where there's practically no hand-holding, you're expected to figure out what to do on your own most of the time. It's pretty ironic that I was resistant to playing these games for so long due to the perceived difficulty, considering how much I love older games. Older games tend to skew towards being harder for several reasons. Possibly because the developers didn't want players to rent the game and beat it in the weekend. Possibly because arcade games were as hard as possible to squeeze out quarters, so why change things for consoles? Or possibly because they genuinely wanted to challenge players. As the years go by, whenever games skew towards being hard, the reason is usually that last one, since the people making games now know it feels really good to complete a tough challenge in a game. Dark Souls is no different. Even though the director Hidetaka Miyazaki has gone on record many times stating that his team didn't go out of their way to try and make the games hard, I'd even argue that Dark Souls is as hard as you make it, and it can even be pretty easy if you allocate your stats in the right way. Turtling is valid, friends. It's basically a bunch of different things that make me like Dark Souls enough to put it as one of my favorites of the decade. The story you discover for yourself, the brilliantly interconnected world, all the different builds, the gameplay. It's not a game everyone can or will enjoy, and the community can be a little annoying, but for the people that do like it, I think it's a special game for them. Like it or not though, you can't deny it brought games into a new age. This one is a bit of a cheat, since it's technically two games, but it's the only one like this on the list. I first played Catherine sometime in 2013 after hearing a pretty large amount of buzz about it. To this day, I think its marketing push must have been pretty aggressive, as Catherine was an Atlas game made in a pre-Persona 5 world. Maybe I'm not giving Persona 4 enough credit here when it comes to giving the company relevancy, but even still, new IPs can be a hard sell to people, especially those with a concept like Catherine. The part romance story, part puzzle climber, part social experiment seemed likely to alienate as many people as it attracted, and yet I've really only heard praise for this game since. 
I think it's managed to stick with a lot of people due to how unique it is, and in case it wasn't obvious by its inclusion on this list, I was one of them. Though I don't think its spot would have been cemented if not for the remaster slash remake Catherine Full Body. In a way, Catherine Full Body is one of the most typical moves Atlas could have made for one of their most atypical titles. A remaster that shoehorns new characters into the narrative is standard fare for Atlas games. Ask any Persona fan their least favorite aspect about Persona 4 The Golden and they'll probably start talking about Marie. Many were already rolling their eyes at the inclusion of a third Catherine when the game was announced, but I was willing to hold my judgment for when the game came out and play it for myself to see if the story was changed for the worse or not. Well, I did play through it, and personally I think Rin ended up being a great addition to the game. I'd say Catherine Full Body is an improvement to the original across the board. There's more characterization for almost everyone. Kay Atherin gets new cutscenes that elaborate how her and Vincent ended up together, a few more bonus levels if you go down a certain path, and plenty else. The game already looked great, but I think the added power of the PS4 smoothed out any rough spots that were there originally. The actual gameplay has been improved as well, like the game highlighting where Vincent can go when hanging onto blocks, or readability on heavy blocks. The undo system is a little more forgiving, which I'm all for since this game actually gets pretty tough later on. I think the biggest gameplay reason for fans of Catherine to check this remaster out though is the new remix mode. This mode made the game considerably harder and I found myself sitting dumbfounded several times due to the new puzzles it introduces. Finally, I want to say that as someone who likes the dub for this game, I'm glad they managed to get every actor to reprise their roles. It would have been pretty jarring if there was new VO mixed in with the old, thankfully that was averted. That said, I'm curious if they re-recorded everything or just used the old voiceover and had the new lines dubbed when needed. The former would obviously require more work, but no one sounded different when reprising their roles, which considering the gap in time between this and the original game's release, you think would be the case. Either way, I'll never forget the nights I spent with Catherine. Full body. Who are you? This is the world of nightmares. I guess you could call me its supervisor. I sense a force of change rising up. What exactly happened in the other world? I guess it doesn't matter. You lambs are all destined to die here anyway. What? Are you ridiculous? Back in 2015, I watched the cult classic 90s television show Twin Peaks for the first time. I immediately became a fan of the series, and quickly found out about the 2010 horror slash third person shooter Deadly Premonition. The game gets compared to it constantly, and if you have even a cursory knowledge of either, it's not hard to see why. Not only is the plot similar in both, they also share the same quirky, endearing atmosphere of an unusual small town. At first, I was content to just watch a let's play of the game, but, and I'm not joking here, five minutes into the game, I realized I needed to play it for myself. I can tell you the exact moment too. It's this part right here. Yeah, I know. He does terrible things to Tom. Nasty, even sadistic things. But that's fine, as long as that's what Tom wants. Think of it. His actions. He's always asking for it. It's his partner's job to fulfill that need, and Jerry knows that. Proof? Well, in the Tom and Jerry show, they live with each other. Hello? Hello? <laughs> fucking, fucking Tom and Jerry. Francis York Morgan is probably one of the greatest protagonists in all of gaming. He never fails to put a smile on my face. But it's not just him. Practically every character in Deadly Premonition is so memorable in their own way. I really don't want to go into any more detail, I'd rather you just play it for yourself. That said, story isn't everything. Ask any fan of Deadly Premonition and they'll probably tell you that while the narrative and characters are amazing, the gameplay is hot trash. And I'll be honest, I don't think it's that bad. Yes, it's certainly not great, but at worst I found it to be a subpar Resident Evil 4 clone, and there are worse things to be than Resident Evil 4 clones. 
The story goes that Sweary, the writer slash director of the game, didn't even want combat, which is sort of obvious. Though, there are some really cool ideas implemented sometimes, such as the chase and stealth sequences. The game will show you your POV and the mysterious raincoat killer's POV during these, and it's a pretty cool idea. The game tends to shit the bed during these though, at least on the PS3 version, but that's something you end up getting used to. Deadly Premonition gave me an experience I'll never forget, and because of it, Sweary gained a lifelong fan in me. The game has amassed a fairly large cult following over time, but even with that I never in a million years would have expected to get a sequel. I hope Deadly Premonition 2 is able to capture the same feeling as the first. Sweary being on board for the project is a good sign, unlike the sign that appeared in my coffee. Did you see that, Zach? Clear as a crisp spring morning. F. K. In. The. Coffee. I knew I could count on it. Never fails. Zach. I can't believe the Bureau still can't get me a satellite phone. These puppies are making me go to another town in the boondocks again. Well, I'll be a happy camper, even if it ends up being a waste of time. At least it would get me out of the cramped city for a while. Right, Zach? I'd consider myself a pretty big fan of Pokemon. Have been since the beginning. Recently, though, I found myself disillusioned with the franchise. Things just seem to keep changing for the worse. Even a remake of Pokemon Sapphire, a childhood staple, couldn't win me back. As time went on, the more I realized how great games like Pokemon Black and White were for the series. I not only have fond memories of the games themselves, but the hype leading up to the games. These were the first Pokemon games where I followed all of the pre-release information. I checked Cerebi.net almost every day for a nugget of new info about them. I remember waking up one morning before school and finding out the designs for the starters and thinking how cool they looked. I remember when the final evolutions for the starters were leaked and thinking they were fake. I remember when some guy named Poke Experto leaked the entire Pokedex in text form. Until recently, Pokemon Black and White were the most controversial entries in the series, and sales reflected that. Most of the time it was people complaining that the designs for the new Pokemon were dumb, or the fact that you had to use the new ones and older ones weren't available until after you beat the game. But as the series jumped to 3D and stagnated, some of the complaints started to wane, and I'm glad these entries are starting to get the respect they deserve. Personally, I liked almost every controversial change they implemented. People will say that there's a quantity over quality philosophy with the designs of the Generation 5 Pokemon. There is certainly a lot of them. In fact, Gen 5 has the most new Pokemon out of all the games. It beats out Gen 1 by 5 monsters and it's likely going to stay in that position if the amount of new Pokemon introduced in later games is anything to go by. Do I think they're low quality though? No, I, I don't. I like quite a lot of them, and this generation also has some all-time favorites. It has some duds too, don't get me wrong, but when there's over 150 Pokemon, I'm willing to look past the designs I don't like. There's also a lot of my favorite type, Bug, this gen. Not only that, but they're bug types that vary from usable for more than the early game to downright amazing. In fact, a majority of the Pokemon in Generation 5 are quite strong, which, while I can see be derided as power creep, I'm personally all for. It means you can use practically any Pokemon you want and you'll see success. And it's not like you'll have to worry about the power creep since you only have access to the new ones until post-game. It's the multiplayer where some problems arise. I don't really want to get into the competitive aspect of Pokemon, as that could be a whole other video in and of itself, but I will say that during Generation 5's time in the sun, or rain, or hail, or sand time in the limelight, it wasn't just the Generation 5 Pokemon that saw use. As for being stuck with the new Pokemon, I like that decision as well. I like to use only new Pokemon anyway, and never use the same Pokemon twice, so this never really bothered me. Nowadays, I also respect the decision for how risky it must have been. Imagine trying to tell the suits that fun Pokemon that Pikachu can't be caught until after the game is completed. They walked this decision back in the sequel, but the fact that it happened at all is pretty astounding. I've been talking about this game for a while now, and I've only really discussed the Pokemon, which is a large aspect of the game, but they're not the only things I like about it. 
Compared to all releases before and since, these games just feel fast and snappy. The battles is where it's most noticeable. Moves have great animations and don't overstay their welcome. There's no awkward pauses in between commands like the older DS titles. The battles also just look fantastic. The animations of the Pokemon give them an extra layer of personality that has been sorely missed ever since the jump to 3D. There is great pixel art on display all over this game, as well as a nice blend of 3D. I also love the music. There are so many incredible tracks like Nimbasa City, Sky Arrow Bridge, Driftvale City, the battle themes too. And of course, this track that plays whenever you get a gym leader down to their last Pokemon. This still gives me goosebumps. Finally, I want to briefly discuss the story and characters of Pokemon Black and White, which I think are not just some of the best the series has to offer, but are legitimately great. Pokemon isn't exactly well known for its stories, but I believe Pokemon Black and White proved that they could be if they really wanted to. Things like Team Plasma appearing to have a good reason for doing the things they're doing, Bianca and Charon taking away different lessons from their losses to you, the gym leaders actually doing their jobs and being characters for once, just to name a few. Hopefully one day the Pokemon series can reach the heights achieved by Pokemon Black and White. Since those games, they felt quite grey. If you're an older fan of the channel, this next game shouldn't come as much of a surprise. It was the subject of my second ever video, and is without a doubt one of my most favorite games of all time. Terraria is the gift that keeps on giving. My opinion on the game is the same as it was when that video was made, so if you're interested in additional thoughts from yours truly, check out that video. I do have a little more to say though. I've managed to clock in a huge amount of hours into this game mostly because the core gameplay loop is just so satisfying. Exploring for materials, crafting those materials into items, using those items to get stronger, rinse, repeat. I can still vividly remember seeing this game for sale back in 2011. I didn't even have a Steam account, but I knew I needed to try this game. The pixel art reminded me of Final Fantasy VI, and the structure, or progression system, if you will, seemed more like an actual game than some contemporaries it might have been compared to. At this point, after all of the updates Terraria has gotten, I don't even think the comparisons between it and Minecraft are apt. I don't mean to disparage Minecraft, but I personally couldn't really get into the game thanks to how open-ended it was. I'm the type of person who will have more fun with a LEGO playset than a box of random bricks, if that makes any sense. Over the years, Terraria has gotten more and more grand while still keeping the appeal that drew me into it in the first place. The finish line just keeps getting further and further away. Terraria has had so many final updates, it's honestly hard to take them seriously when they call 1.4 Journey's End. Not that I'm complaining or anything, since each time one of these huge updates is released it adds an abundance of new ways to play the game. There's only four types of builds you can fall into, and one of them is admittedly not as great as the other three, but how you fall into these builds never has to be the same each time you play. It's pretty crazy to think that after all these years and additions to Terraria that made it greater and greater, it's never gone above $10 in price. Back in 2011 when it first released, I mowed my lawn to get the allowance necessary to pay for this game, and I definitely got my money's worth in that regard. Between the dirt cheap price compared to the amount of content, and the way this game was treated by its developers, the people over at Redigit have garnered a lot of goodwill from the community, and it makes me excited to see what their next project will be, whenever it comes out. Until then, I'll just keep playing Terraria, the game where the good times keep coming.
There used to be a tumultuous relationship between me and The Binding of Isaac. I got the original release of this game the week it came out after picking it up with some spare change I had in my Steam wallet. It was made by the creator of Super Meat Boy, Edmund McMillan, and it kind of looked like The Legend of Zelda, so why not try it? Well, what I didn't expect was that the game was not only hardly like The Legend of Zelda, but was also pretty tough as well. I believe I got to the fourth level before dying, when I found out that whenever you died, you have to start at the beginning. I pretty much put the game down and never planned on going back to it. A few months later, I found out a friend of mine was really into the game. So I started watching this egg-headed man on YouTube looking for tips on how to beat this tough game. Eventually I did manage to beat it, and that was the beginning of something truly great. The truth of the matter though, is the original Binding of Isaac is pretty hard to go back to after all these years. The game is locked at 30 frames per second, runs in flash, and is overall pretty jank. At the time that didn't matter. Once Isaac had its hooks in you with the myriad of different items, characters, strategies, and how each of those synergize in unique ways, I and many others were able to look past the mechanical flaws of the Binding of Isaac. The fact that Florian Himsel, the sole programmer, managed to get all this working in Flash of all things is impressive in and of itself. But the opportunity to improve on Isaac was there, and three years after the original, The Binding of Isaac Rebirth was released, and I haven't looked back since. It was the original Isaac experience, but tightened up in almost every way imaginable. I do think that some things hold up better in the original though, like the animated cutscenes, which look too clean in Rebirth. And the music by Danny Baranofsky can't really be topped in my mind. Though that's not to say Ridiculon did a bad job. Those qualms aside, the moment to moment gameplay is just so much more fine tuned. Any small complaints I may have just don't matter. There's more item synergies, more levels, characters, and they only added more of these with several DLCs that came out over the years. One of which gave the game mod support so the possibilities for more content in the future is practically endless. There have been many roguelikes or roguelites released over the years, but for some reason I never really got into them the same way as Binding of Isaac. Which I think was my first foray into the genre, and I think it's a good introduction too if you don't know what a roguelite is and are curious to try one. Just don't get discouraged like I did on my first run. Chances are though, you've already tried this game since it kinda blew the fuck up over the years. It was really interesting to see Edmund McMillan go from being known as the creator of Super Meat Boy to the person behind The Binding of Isaac. The guy scored two home runs in the volatile indie game scene and proved his success wasn't just a fluke. That's incredible to me. I bet his mother is proud. Scrambling around his room to find a hiding place, he noticed a trap door to the basement hidden under his rug. Without hesitation, he flung open the hatch, just as his mother burst through his door and threw himself down into the unknown depths below. I don't know if this is a controversial statement or not, but I genuinely believe Hotline Miami was one of the most influential indie games of the decade. This hyper-violent, irreverent, 80s throwback action game turned a lot of heads back when it first released. I personally picked it up during the summer sale in 2013 and I sorta of became obsessed. I just wanted to get better and better at the game. It's unreasonably satisfying to maintain a combo for an entire level. The sounds of the weapons pack such a punch and you look so cool effortlessly going down halls and killing dozens of goons. Hotline Miami may technically be an action game, but the way you have to approach challenges make it feel like a puzzle game as well. The dozens of masks also give you all sorts of different perks that let you make a playstyle all your own. It's a truly unique combination, and it feels like the perfect length, never overstaying its welcome. The story of the game is actually full of more intrigue than you would expect too. Despite leaving me with a lot of questions that didn't necessarily need answers, it felt satisfying. But all this wouldn't matter in the slightest without the soundtrack. Every single track in this game is not only great, but also fits the feeling of each level to a T. I guarantee many people's first foray into the synthwave genre was through Hotline Miami, and what an introduction. So many action games released in the past decade owe a thank you to Hotline Miami for paving the way. Without it, we wouldn't have games like Katana Zero or My Friend Pedro. 
Hotline Miami feels really special, and I think part of that is the fact that it wasn't run into the ground with constant sequels. There was a sequel, and while I'm tempted to say that the less said about it the better, that would be a little too harsh. I like Hotline Miami 2 wrong number, but it has a bunch of small problems that just stack up and bother me the more I play it. I think its biggest issue is that it feels much more bloated than the first game. There's maybe one level in Hotline Miami 1 that I somewhat dislike, whereas in Hotline Miami 2 there's several I just outright hate. Pretty much everything good about the first game is still there, just much lesser. Except for the soundtrack, which gets incredibly intense in 2. If they kept going in the direction they went with Wrong Number, then I think the Hotline Miami series would have been significantly less fondly remembered. But no matter what happened, nothing could take away from the quality of Hotline Miami 1. A game from another decade trapped in this one. Remember what I said way back at the beginning of this video, about how rough it was to be a Nintendo fan for the 8th generation? Well, with the release of the Switch, things really started turning around. Nintendo seemed to learn their lesson from the faceplant that was the Wii U, and all of a sudden they were releasing amazing after amazing games. 2017 not only saw the release of a return to form for two of Nintendo's biggest franchises, but also marked the long-awaited return of another great series on the 3DS. I played and liked all these games, but there was another game I played that year as well, and while it may be strange to say, I had a better time with it than any other game that year. To say that Sonic Mania lived up to expectations would be an understatement. From the very beginning, when this game was first announced, people had a good feeling about it, including myself. It was a true 2D throwback to the original Genesis titles that was being developed by highly revered fans of the series. There was obviously a bit of cautious optimism leading up to the release as well, after all this is Sonic the Hedgehog we're talking about, but when the day finally came, practically everyone agreed. It was 20 years late, but this was the real deal. This was the true sequel to Sonic 3 & Knuckles, and not only that, it was also an incredible game. Maybe it was because my Sonic video was still somewhat fresh in my mind, but I couldn't get enough. I would even play a few levels before I went to work in the morning, that's how into it I was. And when I beat the game, I immediately did another playthrough as Knuckles. It was such a nice feeling to play a Sonic game that felt good to control, looked incredible, and sounded fantastic. They even got the special stages right. Sonic Mania really felt like a labor of love. I used to have some gripes with the game, but it was mostly small things, like Act 1 of Mirage Saloon Zone being a reskin of Sky Chase, or the lack of level transitions before certain stages. You know how much I love my level transitions. However, almost all of my criticisms were addressed in the Sonic Mania Plus DLC, which released a year later, along with adding two new characters and a surprisingly fun encore mode, which replaces lives with characters. Basically, if you end up dying as Sonic, but ended up collecting Knuckles and Tails throughout the adventure, you will respawn on the spot as one of those characters. If you don't have any more characters in reserve though, it's game over. It's a pretty small change that still ends up making playthroughs that much more intense in all the right ways. Some people were probably bummed out by the large amount of returning zones, but outside of Green Hill and Chemical Plant, Headcanon really pulled from some unexpected locations which I was happy to see remixed. Oil Ocean, Lava Reef, and Hydrocity were my highlights. Outside of the new zones of course, which are all fantastic, except maybe Act 2 of Titanic Monarch, but even then it's not that bad. It's actually pretty crazy to look back on my old Sonic 3 video and see that every single thing I brought up as a reason for why I like it more than Sonic 2 is in this game. The Elemental Shields, the Insta Shield, sorta, the end act bosses, the level transitions, and best of all, Blue Sphere are all in this game. I know for a fact it wasn't like they were listening to me, rather it just feels validating to know that I wasn't the only one who appreciated those things about the game. 
I don't know what the future holds for Sonic. As far as I know, Headcanon hasn't been contacted by Sega to do a follow-up, which bums me out, since it's not like Sonic Team has been turning heads with their recent entries into the franchise. If anything, the Sonic Team logo feels more like the brand of sacrifice than a seal of quality. Finally, we come to the last game on my list. Out of all the games I've played over the past decade, this was the one I played the most recently, if we don't count Catherine Fullbody. I played it so recently, in fact, I wondered if I was being too hasty in having it be one of my games of the decade. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that it belonged. Valhalla Cyberpunk Bartender Action is a visual novel made by Venezuelan developer Sukaban Games. And even though it was released back in 2016, I only picked it up this year when it was ported to the Nintendo Switch. I had seen screenshots of the game quite a bit, and I thought it looked very nice, but I'll admit I was somewhat put off by the genre. The closest thing I had played to visual novels were games like Phoenix Wright and, well, Catherine. But those had other genres mixed in. Valhalla is pretty much a visual novel through and through. The closest thing to gameplay comes in mixing drinks, which hardly classifies as gameplay in the traditional sense. But all that aside, I decided to go into it knowing what to expect and just see how I thought about it. Needless to say, I'm glad I did. This was such a nice game to play after unwinding from a day at work. I'd sometimes even make myself drinks while I played to get more immersed. First off, I love the art style of this game. The retro computer game aesthetic fits right in with the setting of a dingy, low-lit, futuristic bar. Second off, I really ended up caring for not only Jill, but a lot of the cast. In a weaker game, a character like Dorothy would have been absolutely insufferable, but I think she's pretty funny in most of her encounters. Alma was a good voice of reason, who also managed to avoid any sort of played-out hacker tropes. I think my favorite characters though were Betty and Deal. The nature of their relationship I found to be quite intriguing. Not only that, but the way they were able to bounce conversations off not only Jill but themselves made for great dialogue. Basically whenever two separate characters interact as a treat, but since Betty and Deal almost always show up as a pair, it was more common with them. This is another game where the soundtrack is fantastic, but additional praise needs to be given due to the way you get to choose the music before each day of work. By the end of the game you'll probably have a consistent set list, but part of the fun lies in checking out new tracks and seeing how you like them. Finally, I want to commend the feeling this game gives you. Jill's perspective and story in Valhalla is quite low stakes compared to the goings on of the world around her. Patrons like Say and Jamie would probably be the main characters in any other type of game with the kind of dangerous stuff they get wrapped up in. But we don't play as them. We play as the bartender, and get to hear about these explosive events while we have to deal with our own problems. As a person who loves low stakes stories, this made for a great juxtaposition. I'm really glad I came around and checked out Valhalla. Sugman Games can consider me a regular from now on. And there we are, 9 of my favorite games from the past decade. Let me know what your favorite games of the decade were in the comments, maybe we have some games in common. Don't take it too personally if there aren't though. I'd like to thank you all for making it all the way through this video, and I hope to see you all in 2020.